So, good morning, everybody. Also, greetings uh, to those people who are watching us on streaming online. I, I heard there are a lot of them. Uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, the challenges, and today, we'll talk more about the strategies. And uh, if you could come in. So just to short introduce myself, my name is Tomislav Tomasevic. Uh, I come from the Institute for Political Ecology in Croatia. And I'm here uh, really honored that I can uh, present uh, Barbara Muraka, who will uh, give a lecture uh, from capitalist accumulation to solidarity econo economy. Uh, Barbara will speak around uh, 45 to one hour, and then uh, we'll open the floor for the questions and comments from the audience. So just a short introduction. Uh, Barbara Muraka is currently assistant professor for environmental and social philosophy at Oregon State University and co-director of the International Association of Environmental Philosophy. She holds a PhD in environmental ethics from the University of Greifswald, Germany. From 2012 to 2014, she worked as a senior researcher with the colleague Postgrowth Societies at the Institute of Sociology of the University of Vienna. And in 2014, as many of you probably know, participated in the organization of the fourth International Degrowth Conference in Leipzig. Her research interests encompass social philosophy, sustainability and degrowth research, environmental ethics, process philosophy, feminist philosophy and ecological economics. On degrowth, she has published several articles, both in English and in German. She explores the importance of concrete utopias and social experiment for a social ecological transformation. She is passionate about environmental and social justice and, of course, philosophy. So, without further ado, Barbara, please take the floor. Okay, let's start. Can you hear me everywhere? Because my voice is a little getting down, but let's see. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me uh, to give this speech here, this incredible conference. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it was a little bit strange when I got the invitation of giving a keynote speech at the 5th Degrowth Conference, because I had already given a, a, a keynote speech at the 4th Degrowth Conference in Leipzig, so I was kind of struggling with myself, what can I say that it's different? Um, so, and I, I adopted the Star Wars strategy. Uh, so this today is the first episode, which comes before what I presented in Leipzig. <laughs> so if you want to have the two, the two episodes together, this is still available on the website <laughs> of that conference. And uh, um, that talk was m more focused on the transformation of the social imaginary and degrowth as a concrete utopia. Today, I'm focusing more on the core topic of this conference, which is more about institutional transformation. And, and I will also say something about challenges and not only about strategies. Um, <clears throat> so this is what I, um, I want to talk about. Today, I think there is an echo with the mic, so I don't know whether I let me know what I have to do. <laughs> so starting briefly, very briefly, because it's a huge topic, uh, talking about the capital accumulation and the logic of, of growth and how they interact and relate. In three steps, expansion, control over the margin as marginalized, and the luring into hegemonic culture. I will then talk about why um, I'd rather speak about um, growth societies and not societies that grow, and how, why and how they're entering a crisis. And then moving on to alternatives, and degrowth is a radical, a project for a radical social transformation, in particular listing up in a non-exhaustive way some kind of radical transformation of institutions, and I li leave out a lot of it, and then moving on to possible also to practices and uh, how they, in, they uh, are related to institutions. So capitalist accumulation and the logic of growth. What is growth? I'm not starting from there, but just to remind us, uh, when we talk about growth, usually people, the first thing that people uh, think about is monetary growth measured by GDP. I would assume that everyone sitting in, the ro in this room knows very well that this is not the whole story and that monetary growth is very much related to the material flows in the economy. 
This is why most people sitting here, when talking about growth, consider material growth. The material and energy flows, and especially the over-exploitation of ecological and social resources and sinks. What I want to focus on in my talk is, not, is another way of uh, approaching and understanding this, which is considering growth as a structure, structural growth, if you want is a social, institutional, and mental infrastructure which is characteristic of modern capitalistic societies. Accordingly, growth is not just a byproduct of modern capitalistic societies. It plays a structural role for the constitution and reproduction of capitalistic societies. The growth imperative of capitalism according to Eric Pinot, can be framed as the monetary production economy based on accumulation. So there is a very strong correlation between the logic of growth and capitalistic accumulation in a specific way which is characteristic of modern capitalistic societies. This would take a whole talk of its own. I am just focusing on this uh, relation between the logic of accumulation and the logic of growth in three steps. First one is considering the logic of growth under capitalist accumulation in terms of expansion. Expansion at least in three dimensions, in space, in time, and in terms of what I call life energy. Let me explain. Expansion towards new territories in the most immediate sense of the term expansion, in a literal sense, really occupying and taking on into capitalist mode, uh, into co capitalistic commodification of ter territories in the term sense of land, land grabbing, wild extractivism, but also in a metaphorical sense of the term, like the, the ongoing commodification of ecosystem services, for example, and ongoing privatization. It's not only about quantitative expansion, it's also about the quality of the expansion, which happens increasingly in, in late capitalism towards risky areas and territories, again, in a metaphorical and in a literal sense of the term. We are observing right now an increasing willingness to take risks. Just think of technologies like fracking, geoengineering, and um, deep sea grilling, GMOs, and the like, right? So it's a kind of expansion into risky areas. Francois Schneider has used this term that I kept, keep quoting because I think it's very useful to, to use, is that, that the expansion is based on expanding the possibility for further expansion, which means expanding the capacity to exploit. In a very literal sense, creating large infrastructures like the highway that should cross the Tipnis in Bolivia is a way to, ac to have access to more resources and extracting these resources. So large infrastructures are an example for expanding the capacity to exploit. There are other examples, but also the deregulation of financial markets is a form of expanding the capacity to exploit, having more capital in, the in terms of money flowing around that ends up indeed in, for example, land grabbing. Expansion is not only expansion in space, it's also in expansion in time and in life energy. And we, if we talk about expansion in time, we're talking about intensification, which is uh, s essential for supporting capitalist accumulation. We are observing an increasing intensification of the pace of life and the pressure onto people in terms of competition. And this is not only true for those who are at the top level of being managers, but you have the competition, a tr triggering competition among the poor as well. <clears throat> a, a constant pressure to perform, increasing, not constant, that would be good, an increasing pressure to perform, uh, combined with a privatization of responsibility, like if you're sick, it's your fault. Um, if you're poor, it's your fault, because you have made some investment mistakes in your life, right? And. Uh, Everyone, and, and I, I use this term about how important it is to, to uh, it's getting to, everyone's going to fitness center, wellness, taking time for wellness. Um, and I think wellness is increasingly a kind of a class and status, status investment um, in, in society. 
Increasing debts is another important element of this logic of expansion because debt triggers demand. I will address that in my last slide, trying to re -under understand and reconfigure the idea of debt. In general, what we are observing is an even increasing, more increasing commodification of all basic services. I moved from Germany to the US, I've been there for two years and I'm kind of, it's not that I didn't know that, but leaving that on my own skin, so to say, it's really interesting how it means, what it means to live in a place in which most basic services are commodified, education, health, and so on, and all the area of reproduction. In other words, Expa capitalist accumulation as expansion is an increasing marketization and commodification of life processes, both ecological and social. The second step, what in capitalist accumulation and the logic of growth <coughs> mean, is the control over the margins, not because it is a margin of its own, but because it has been marginalized. This is a kind of indirect control of so-called peripheral territories. Again, peripheral from the point of view of what is the power defi def of definition of the center. Um, this is not occupied and included into the capitalist logic of commodification in, in, directly, but it is functional to that very logic and it's rendered functional to that very logic by means of a kind of indirect control. For example, as a reservoir for further expansion in the future, and a, a for cri crisis buffer. Consider, for example, the amazing creativity of folks uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the new media um, that are developing and de uh, new ideas in a, some of them in a commons-based way. This could be considered as, from that, this point of view, as a possibility for further expansion in the future, right? So let, let it happen. And even subsistence farming is very functional as a kind of buffering. I'm not saying that it's bad, I'm just saying it works very well as a kind of buffering for crisis. In general, capitalist accumulation and it, under the uh, paradigm of, of uh, the growth imperative um, controls the so-called reproductive activities, both social and ecological, by means not very much of including them into the commodification, but of devaluating them. Consider the underpaid, how underpaid people working in the care sector are, for example, <clears throat> and how um, environmental damage is being um, externalized and shifted onto other regions and other social groups, including the future. Discounting is nothing else than that kind of shifting the burdens onto future generations and externalizing the consequences. This devaluation and this marginalization is essential for the logic of growth and the logic of capitalist accumulation, and it's Im implemented by means of oppression and discrimination in different ways. To say, to say it differently, the area of reproductivity, I always write the word according to how Adelheid Bizeka and Sabine Hofmeister do it with the RE in brackets, because to call the, all the regeneration processes and activity as merely reproductive and non-productive is part of this logic of marginalization. They are not the real stuff. They're not the core of capitalistic accumulation. But they are, in a different sense, very productive. They are the basis for society reproduction and regeneration. So these are necessary conditions for capitalistic accumulation, but they have to be kept as uh, devaluated free gifts in order for that logic to keep working. And the last example that I'm giving is, um, the last dimension that I'm addressing is uh, the logic of growth under capitalistic accumulation as a kind of luring people into the hegemonic culture of growth. The German sociologist Harald Welzer uses a pretty interesting term, which is that growth is a mental infrastructure. Uh, but you could also use Serge Latouche's concept, which is very well known in the degrowth movement, of a colonization of a social imaginary by means of the logic of growth. The social imaginary is that background of all shared and established values, the basis for the collective self-understanding of communities and societies, that which legitimizes our practices, our actions, and our institutions. And that has been heavily colonized by the logic of growth uh, as a pervasive and dominant paradigm 
that shapes social expectations and guarantees recognition, not, in the, not very much in the sense of prestige, but in the sense of what we all need to be humans, which is to be seen by others. So we all cannot be humans without other seeing us as members of the community. So the pressure is very high to correspond to the collective expectations and being acceptable in the eyes of others. And this is the, the power of this colonization of the social imaginary because it's very hard to step down from it. And the costs, in, the social and cultural costs are very high. We end up dreaming ready-made dreams and gave up dreaming our own dreams, even daring articulating our own dreams. The American dream is the best example of a ready-made dream that can be bought uh, if you have the money for it. Uh, what, uh, in late capitalism, um, the, the, the logic um, is needs, uh, for the logic of, of growth and the logic of capitalist accumulation, needs neoliberal subjects, which means translated that we all have to be entrepreneur of ourselves. And many of us, are that and are happy to be that because there, there are some elements which are even interesting about that. Being an entrepreneur oneself means that the individual is like an enterprise, is investing in herself, um, is considering her own life as a portfolio, an investment portfolio. And here is where, for example, wellness plays a major role. Uh, you invest into your health for the future. Um, but the risk and responsibility are completely privatized and left to you as an individual. They're no longer addressed in a solidary way uh, by the community and societies. This logic is a little more sophisticated than just the logic of more. We all are critical about the logic of capitalist accumulation, the logic of growth as the logic of more. But this is also a logic of better. Sometimes I hear that, well, it's not more we want, it's better. But the very logic of better can be framed just within that narrative of neoliberal subjects, of the, being entrepreneur of yourself, thinking of the narrative of self-enhancement, self-fulfillment, improvement, development as personal development as well. So you we have to be very careful about that. When I talk to people, especially in the US, and, and, and they come up and say, but degrowth is such a bad word, it's so depressing. We need something positive to say. <laughs> No, we don't, explicitly and exactly because that can be a way of breaking this narrative of better, right, in that sense. Okay, sorry. Um, it's because of the echo, but now it's fine, so I can go closer. Okay, so in a, in a, in a word, um, the logic of growth under capitalist accumulation has a very strong emotional appeal. Um, and that emotional appeal, on the other hand, leads to the use and, com and commodification and use for capitalistic accumulation of our creative desire and creative desires. Um, having presented that in a, in, a, in a brief way, let me say why I... Um, <laughs> I don't speak of societies that grow or might not grow, but I'm speaking about growth societies when talking about modern capitalistic societies. Um, this is something that is a, is a link to the other Star Wars episode, right? So <laughs> you have seen this already. I'm just using it here, this slide again, because I think it's pretty good to present this uh, idea. Modern capitalistic societies need growth to keep going for a bunch of reasons. At least this is the narrative embedded in the logic of growth. Grow and we have heard uh, yesterday, Clive has deconstructed and dismantled that very logic. Um, to secure well-being, to create employment, to support and generate revenue for the welfare state, which is probably one of the most important functions that economic growth has played. Um, to keep social conflicts down and to save the face of the pseudo-democracies in which we live in terms of the output legitimation, meaning increasing welfare instead of increasing participation. I use, and most of you know that picture again, so sorry if I'm using that again, but I think it's, it's very clear what it means that modern capitalist societies stabilize themselves dynamically. I use the metaphor of a crazy bicycle. Um, 
modern capitalist society are like a crazy bicycle. This is why you have a hamster sitting on the bicycle. A bicycle has to keep moving in order not to fall down. This crazy bicycle has to keep accelerating in order not to fall down. The structure of the bicycle is such that if it stops accelerating, it falls down. Falling down means crisis. And we are approaching a crisis of growth societies because the capitalistic growth imperative is um, running against constraints for further growth in, in a different sense. Just in an immediate, to use the image of the bicycle, if you keep accelerating on your bicycle and never stop for maintenance, you can imagine what happens. Um, so the very logic of constant acceleration undermines its own conditions of reproduction in the long run. The promise attached to that might have worked in certain social groups in certain countries for a certain time, but it's no longer working for in, in, in general. And the output legitimation is also no longer delivered as it had been, so we are facing also a crisis of democracy in terms of a crisis of the output legitimation. And of course, <clears throat> Very important are the, the threshold through which we are going. I don't like to use the term limits. We had a discussion yesterday, a whole session about limits. I rather use the term thresholds because a threshold means that after the threshold, the qualitative, something changes qualitatively and you cannot keep using the same tools that you used before to address it. And we're talking about ecological threshold and social threshold, just the same. So we are approaching a crisis of growth societies. If nothing changes and the bike remains as it is, what happens is that the bicycle falls down. And this is the scenario of economic shrinking, which I don't call degrowth, because it's different from what we are here for and what we're talking about. And I don't, call, I don't, I don't like speaking about the end of growth. I'd rather speak about the end of easy growth. Things are getting more complicated, more challenging, and keeping growing <coughs> is... Uh, um, increasing even more social conflicts all over the world. So, in a word, if growth-based societies stop growing, they enter crisis, destabilizations, impoverishment. So what happens here? If, if everything stays as it is, the business as usual condition, are we entering a new phase of capitalism without growth? Is it still capitalism? How would that look like? I think that this is a pretty plausible scenario. And I have a sense, living in the US, that we are pretty close to that scenario already. Um, so we are moving from growth capitalism to a stagnation economy in which inequality is dramatically increasing and social mobility is basically frozen. <clears throat> we have many more social conflicts that cannot be addressed by the comfortable perspective of growth. So they have to be addressed in a different way by mean of ideology, manipulation, or direct social control and repression. We have less or no redistribution and the end of welfare-based services. <clears throat> and this is, some, some scholars are addressing that. The, the, the face of capitalism would change from accumulation of capital, which is reinvested in order to generate more capital, to accumulation of wealth, money being invested in luxury goods, pretty much like it was the time of the feudal, of feudal societies where you did have investment, not investment, sorry, but just spending money for luxury goods for the few. There are some conservative um, critiques of growth, and I don't consider them part of the degrowth discourse, who say, well, but it's not all too bad. We will have a scenario in which a reduction of working hours will come, but uh, with no redistribution of money or of time. So people will have to have multiple jobs, will have to take care of, uh, of their children and of their aging parents and maybe disabled friends or family members because this is all completely privatized and reallocated to the families with the consequences that you can imagine in terms of gender relations and how that is distributed among the genders. But Sam says, well, that's not too bad because we can have a cultural adaptation we can move from material to spiritual or cultural values, so people will be happy uh, anyway. This is why I have a very strong allergy against arguments, not because I don't think that it's important to move from material values to other values, but there is a danger 
if we don't consider that within the structures in which we live, uh, to push that too far and to consider happiness as the measure of the change. Because you could indeed have happiness under these conditions, subjective happiness. And of course, you wouldn't have any redistribution. And interestingly enough, instead of solidarity in this scenario, you have basically philanthropy. So the rich who invested in India, their luxury good might be very nice and give something to the poor, probably to keep a kind of social stability. More to that, you could have an, 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 a scenario of really happiness behind the wall. And the, uh, the fact that we are moving back towards this idea of keeping the borders and controlling societies, you could use a Polanyan framework to explain it, which I'm not doing here. Um, it's quite scary and very interesting. I was just in a comedy in, German, in Germany. It's not particularly good, but it was interesting because it was a kind of a, I'm not sure whether it's a utopia or a dystopia of Germany that had completely realized an ideal of eco-sufficiency, has built a wall around itself. Everyone lives in a totally ecologically sound way. There is no plastic. Plastic is banned. Transport is banned. Um, and immigration is banned, <laughs> of course. There is no need for people to get there. Everyone should be happy in their own place. And there is no reason for the people to leave the country because they're happy. And happiness is an ideology. You have to be happy. Um, if you're not happy, it's a problem because it's a happy... And I am reminded of the place where I live now in the US, but it's a different topic. And there is a strong ideology of self-sufficiency in terms of autarky and this idea of being, we made it to the lifeboat, this idea of the lifeboat privilege with all the consequences that we know. Let's ask the good life for whom, at whose cost, and at, under which conditions. You do have ideas of forms of radical in a sense of right-wing bioregionalism, not all bioregionalism is that way, but it's been co-opted by almost eco-fascist perspective to a certain extent, which means population control. Leisure and happiness about culture and spiritual values are av available for, for those who don't have multiple jobs and have to take care of their uh, family members or friends who need, need and care, but just for those who can afford it. And we have an exclusive and excluding solidarity with conflicts and competition, not within the small lifeboat, lifeboat, which is protected from the outside, but among communities and different groups. From this point of view, solidarity or solidarity economy, which is one of the topics I mean, has to talk about, solidarity is not just a, a nice to have, it's not a wishful desire, it is a necessary struggle faced with that scenario. OK, well, let's move on to the second part, which is about alternatives. So what can degrowth, the degrowth discourse and the degrowth movement say here? What do we have to offer? I think that scenario is fairly plausible. And I think that degrowth is a project for a radical transformation of society beyond capitalism. And this is the only way how it can works, work. It requires a transformation of society's basic institutions, and this is the motto of the degrowth movement. It's not comparable to the scenario of recession. And again, sorry for those who know that image already, I like to use this other image, which is a different bicycle. So it's really about radically changing the frame of the bicycle. Because this bicycle does not have to constant accelerating in order to stabilize itself. But it doesn't have to be still and not move. It can move in different direction. And it's large enough to host different people. And this bicycle is a space frame bicycle. It is designed on a commons-based way. So um, it is designed as an open source. Everyone can use the design and change it. It can be reassembled in different ways according to the needs. It's a low-tech, to a certain extent, bicycle. And, I, and that, I think, is a symbol of the kind of radical transformation that we need uh, to move towards degrowth. And it's indeed a transformation for a creative and collective alternative path for a democratic, just, and solidary stabilization of society beyond growth. So, 
What are we talking about when we talk about, what does it mean when we talk about uh, degrowth as a, rad a project for a radical social transformation? Again, this is also part of a relation of the Star Wars narrative. You have seen that in Leipzig already. I'm shifting the focus slightly. Um, there are at least three dimensions of transformation. One is the structural and institutional dimension. One is the transformation of the social imaginary. And one is the transformation of and by practices and social experiments. Um, in Leipzig, I focus on the middle dimension, the transformation of the social imaginary. I would like to talk more today about the first one, the structural and institutional level of transformation. But let me give you an image about how these different levels are related together by using the metaphor of a living body, of a living organism. You could consider the structural and institutional level as the structure of the body, skeleton, muscle, the, stru the, the, the biophysical structure of your body. Um, the social imaginary could be if you want the soul, right? So, or, or the mind. I, I like the word soul better than the word mind because mind is too rational. Uh, or the emotions and the feelings. And practices are the actions, the acts, the steps, the behavior. Now, there is a very strong relation between practices and institution. It's not that your body is a given and enables you to do certain steps or some movements and certain actions, period. But it is that your movements, actions, and behavior changes in the long run the structure of your body. You cannot completely change it, but it has, there is a very strong reciprocal relation between practices and institutions at that point. And my favorite model for these are queer practices, uh, transgender, transsexual, intersexual um, groups and practices related to that area, how much they change, not only the structure of your body, but your self-understanding in the long run. And using that metaphor, I would say that institutions are long-term sedimented practices. This is why a radical transformation of institutions can come from alternative practices if they're connected, networked, and repeated over and over in different places in different ways, uh, over and over again. Um, so what I have now is something that for some of you might sound a little uh, too fast and superficial, but um, I'm kind of giving a list of some examples, and since the list could be endless, I've just picked up some of those, which are possible paths of transformation of institutions in this sense of um, sedimented practices. Uh, the first is the reappropriation of real democracy and self-determination. And there are some essential conditions for real democracy. One of these is a formal condition. I live in the US, I've been living there for two years. I am not allowed to participate in, the, in shaping how decision making is um, made and that influences my life because I am an immigrant. And that's true for uh, all the immigrants everywhere. They are, don't have the formal condition for participate even in the superficial and formal structure of, of democracies. But this is not enough. Reappropriating real democracy means to, to change the substantial and material conditions. Because if you have the formal right to participate, but you don't have the substantial and material possibilities, it doesn't make any, any difference. So that means uh, addressing, for example, inequality, discrimination, and racialization. Uh, when I say reappropriating, it's also reappropriating democracy down into the civil society. Democracy is not about referendum. It might be expressed in a referendum if you have a long process of a, a very active and vivid society that works on that and then it might end up with something like that. But democracy taken back into society is really shaping democratically different ways of living together at the level at which we can influence that. Increasing collective self-determination. The most important area is reorganizing re and <coughs> radically changing the, sec the, the economic, the, the production sector, the economy is more than that. Mm. And we do have examples that show the way. We have already practices that show the way how that can go. Uh, moving beyond competition towards cooperation. Now, 
the narrative that competition is better, is more efficient, is more productive, I never believed into that narrative. But even if you want to accept that, it might have worked for a cer certain time in the time of mass production. We have now reached a time in which this is no longer necessary. We can completely change the way production is structured and organized. And the commons movement is a very good model about how can, that can happen, showing that cooperation is indeed much better, more efficient in the right sense of the term efficiency, and more productive. Uh, we need more economic democracy, not only in the sense of increasing the power of decision making within current structure, economic structure such as companies and enterprises, this is also important, but we need more democratic control of the whole uh, structure of the economy, what it produces, how it's produced, by whom, where, how use and consumption works. And a support and for uh, local production structures and to think about how to coordinate local production structure if we don't want to end up with this mythology of authority and closed solidarity that I have mentioned before. We need a quality, this is not all new ideas, I'm just collecting from others, right? Qualitative diversification of production on a local scale instead of leaving it to the allegedly efficient allocation of the market, which is only efficient in order to generate profit for those who are in power, but not efficient for the society and for improving the uh, life of a people in a community. So diversification of production, which does not mean, again, uh, rendering regions independent from one another. This is something which is very dangerous. It has to be combined, and it will be combined, with solidarity-based exchange and some kind of coordination. And then interventions against, against the inbuilt obsolescence of products, the short life of products. Uh, when I say intervention, I don't only mean political regulations. I don't think that we have the only tool is to wait for a top-down intervention and political regulation. This is important, that'd be great. I don't see it happening any soon. But I also think that there are a lot of practices that we can take on now in terms of moving beyond that. In terms of new technologies, again, referring, there are sessions talking in this conference addressing convivial technologies, common space technologies that really address this issue, like we make it different. We don't wait for someone to do it for us. Um, reconsidering shifting towards recycling and repair and, 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 and the like. Um, oops. Reorganizing innovation and infrastructure, again, there is much more to say about that. I'm just giving some uh, headlights. Um, in, in, in the same sense that I mentioned before, uh, developing convivial technologies and innovation which are for the common good, which are not at a level that cannot be controlled by people and are only in the hand of a few experts. And these kind, kind of technologies, like large-scale technologies, which are only in the hand of experts, increase our dependencies dramatically. Whereas convivial technology are con con technologies for autonomy, are technologies that reinforce not dependency but autonomy. And thinking of alternative infrastructures that are not oriented toward expanding the capacity to exploit but to reduce it, such as um, shifting towards maintenance, conviviality, and sharing. I, I, when I was in northern Germany, northern eastern Germany, in <clears throat> Western Pomerania many years ago, I remember that uh, the roads had holes. All roads had big holes, and for bike cyclists, was was a it was a nightmare. And then I remember we were talking with the local administration, saying, "Can you just repair the roads?" So, well, no, we have our budget structure in different areas and the, the, the budget that comes for infrastructure is to build new infrastructures and we're not allowed to shift that budget to repairing existing infrastructures. So this is a, an administrative level which is, I would almost say ridiculous if it weren't tragic, right? So they couldn't shift the budget, they could build new roads and they did, they built a highway, but they couldn't repair the bike lanes. I, I've heard an interview with uh, Winona LaDuke recently on Democracy Now, um, talking about the struggles of indigenous people in Dakota and other places in, in, in the US and Canada against 
pipelines. And one of the critiques that has been moved to her is the usual critique. Well, but it is essential for creating jobs. We have all, all these skilled people who are very good at building pipelines. And she answered, yes, it's true. They should be pi build pipelines for the people rather than for fossil fuels. And mentioned the fact that they should build pipelines to get water to the uh, citizens of Flint, Michigan, so that they can get water which is not contaminated instead of building pipelines for fossil fuels. Um, one incredibly important area which I'm not addressing is reorganizing education and how knowledge is being generated. Not just with nice words. Inter transdisciplinarity are very important, but they're just fashionable words. And my favorite one is the term operationalization. I haven't counted how much, how often it appears in all the programs for funding research at the EU level, but this is the new super paradigm has to be operationalizable for society, which is ridiculous. So reappropriating what knowledge we need, how knowledge is generated, whose knowledge. Um, and I was stuck when I was in Quito in, in May that the indigenous university has been shut down because it does not correspond to international academic standards. Oh boy. So what's the problem? I think it's the international academic standards the problem and the, power, the, the relation of power and domination about, about that. And we need other types of knowledge as well, value-oriented and value-orienting knowledge. Again, maybe I'm bringing too much of the perspective from my living in the U. US right now, but there is, there is an attack against all humanities at all levels. Everything goes into more science, more technology, more engineering. This is what counts, this is what counts. We, all the changes go into this, the little unit, the gene-centric change that we need. It's all at that level. So we have to fight that. And also different education in terms of developing different skills that we need for um, different communities. Um, and finally, uh, reorganizing work, everything to the politics of time. Um, moving beyond the separation between time for work and time for life. Decoupling revenue and access to services from income and work. And there are fabulous concept, not only the unconditional basic income, but something that Van Sang uh, could talk more about, which is, for example, the idea of the dotation unconditionnelle d'autonomie, the unconditional autonomy allowance, which is a, a degrowth project developed especially in France, um, and renegotiating and reshaping the gender division of labor and the distinction between so-called productive and reproductive activities. Let me just mention one thing that is well known for people from Germany, which is the four-in-one model that is pretty old that Frigga Haupt developed. It's a kind of provocative thought about how to reshape the structure of, one, of a day in different hours, right? So taking four hours for maybe paid work, we might go beyond that, but Reproductive activities, including care, cultural self-realization, self-fulfillment, and bottom-up political and social work, service for the community. Wouldn't that be nice? Pardon? Oh, well, the cultural, well, you know, this is a German <laughs> proposal. <laughs> Self-realization can be framed as fun. <laughs> okay, so um, I can't enter into the discussion about, all oh, right, this is a great list, a wishful list. How do we go there? I think that the degrowth movement has a very strong power for moving towards the transformation that it needed as a platform and as a bridge among different social movements. And I have mentioned that already in, in the other Star Wars uh, episode. Um, in, in, in enhancing strategic and substantial alliances between so-called antagonistic and prefigurative types of protest movements and social experiments, such as, um, and, and it has ha is happening, the indignados and environmentalists squatting an urban bottom-up reappropriation projects, so more antagonistic projects and more prefigurative models. Um, climate justice and climate camps on the one hand, and groups like the Transitions Town who are less antagonistic but kind of imagining uh, alternatives to live without fossil fuels. Environmental justice in commons, and the Global North and the Global South, there was a fabulous panel here addressing alliances yesterday. 
um, anti-productivists and eco-feminists. Uh, I don't want to missionarize anyone into degrowth. I think that would be a fatal idea. So what is important is to consider that as a working platform. And people, if they want to use the term, they can, but it's not the point. The point is to build these alliances and networks. Well, when you talk about subjects, it's not that the subjects, which is all of us, are ready-made there. Because you remember when I was talking about the luring into the hegemonic culture? Well, from that point of view, the colonization of a social imaginary affects all of us. It's not external to us. So what we need is a decolonization through subversive practices and laboratories of liberation. And I think we can learn a lot from feminism here. Feminists understood very soon that patriarchy is not something external to them. It's not an enemy out there. But it's a structure that has been internalized, embodied in their own, in the self-understanding of people, both women, men, and other genders, as a normative structure to live and to be accepted in society. So what to do there? We need protective zones to start the process of radical liberation, to experiment and experience that alternatives are possible, not only at the ideal and conceptual level, but at the level of experiences. And, and these are social experiments which are, for me, laboratories where we can reappropriate and liberate desire and imagination. Um, I'm kind of echoing here, for those of you who might know the queer discussion, Judith Butler, who wrote this fabulous book about undoing gender, in terms of gen the, the gender norm, the heteronormative gender norm is so strong that you, and it's not just out there, but you can, through subversive practices, shift that meaning. And it's a very powerful tool to change yourself as a subject of action. Why don't we think about undoing growth or undoing capitalism through subversive practices, through prefigurative and performative practices that not, do not only envision the possibility, but embody it right now, right here, even if it's not yet there as a social norm. Um, shifting, twisting, resignifying dominant norms and meanings by the way, a lot through play, game, art. This is a very strong way of a performative shift here. And I think queer practices is something we all can learn from. Let, the example that I like is to move, to, to create spaces for the uselessness of play against the idea of utility maximization. I was watching a documentary about gamification which is, you know, to increase the motivation of employee, you, you put in games so that they can play against each other like waiters, they kind of play of, about how many drinks they sell of a certain type, and that increases their motivation. For whom? For the profit of the employer. Wonderful. So the uselessness is a very crucial way of, uh, per, uh, subversive way of rethinking and addressing this idea that everything has to be some kind of oriented towards a goal and a utility goal. I think new social movements embody that already, and other than all social movements, care for relations, for the body, the necessity, the needs of the body, and for emotions, and create niches of resistance, which are also spaces of autonomy. I'm skipping this because I'm talking too long. Uh, but we can go back that in the discussion about sufficiency, voluntary simplicity, or changing the structure, institutional structure. Um, a, a very brief example, you're all familiar with that, about what it means to move from competition to solidarity. I have mentioned the commons movement already. I think the global network for solidarity economy, with all its contradictions, is a good example of something that is possible, uh, a form in which solidarity is institutionalized as a principle of interaction among different uh, cooperatives where democracy is embodied in the decision structure process, but there is more to it. There is a cultural framing that changes the culture of use, consumption, and reciprocal relations. And solidarity economy is oriented towards needs, abilities, and concrete life conditions, and not toward the constant profit accumulation, towards performance, and the pressure of success. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. There are people here who can talk about that much more than me. 
Uh, but I, I think this is a, the, the Catalan Integrated Co Cooperative. There is much more to that. I like it because it's a good example of the combination. It, is it still active? <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> Uh, a combination of antagonistic action like Occupy Banking with prefigurative, prefigurative as imagining and living, embodying an alternative future today in the way in which people live together. I'm not going into details. You can check the website and, and learn more about what they're doing. I think this is incredible because it really addresses the different aspects of life, um, food, health, like, you know, collaborative health, etc. And then I'm concluding, as I announced at the beginning, about the, the discussion about debt. There is a discussion within the degrowth discourse and the degrowth movement about that. And it's, if you read the degrowth vocabulary for a new era, you find that in the introduction as well, about um, degrowth being not very much about a kind of a different narrative of austerity about less, about um, sufficiency, but it's really about the, 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 the French term used there is dépense, which is basically about squandering as a liberation way beyond that. And I think it's very important, very interesting. And I would like to address, but also dangerous, so I would like to address that in two steps. When we speak about debt, are we talking about which and whose debt? In general, debt under the logic of capitalism is a driver of growth, a very important driver of growth, and at the same time of oppression, which is almost the same uh, kind of mechanism. It does not only stimulate demand, but increasing dependency of people who are constantly under pressure. I have just to look at my students who end their college with an amazing amount of debt that uh, heavily infringes their possibility to make choices for the life that they would like to live, even in terms of a more sound way of living in society, because they have to pay back their debts. This is the visible debt of capitalism that focuses only on one side of the dependency, because debt and indebtedness and, private and, and public indebtedness is a fundamental um, driver and a fundamental structure to keep capitalist accumulation ongoing. So you could consider that there is a, a reciprocal dependency here, and people who are indebted have a kind of a power about that because, they're, if, because their dependency is functional as essential for that will to keep, to keep moving. So you could think debt differently. Debt, in a general sense, is really very much about, is a, is a relational symbol of reciprocal dependence. We use this, that, that term in daily life. I feel indebted to a friend who helped me or, you know. There, there is a way in which the term has a different meaning, in which the reciprocity of that is, uh, is at the center. And this is explicitly what is being denied under the logic of growth and capitalistic accumulation, because admitting that would be to admit the radical dependency onto that marginalized that I have addressed before. Thinking of other debts, ecological debt, colonial debt, Reproduction debt, how much reproductive activities, both social and ecological, have been supporting, uh, giving credits, if you want, to the core of capitalist production and accumulation. This is, it has to be rendered invisible because it is a very strong challenge to the whole logic and self-narrative of the system. We do have in traditional societies a different way to address debt with periodical cancellation of debt by destroying it. Uh, like in Jubilees, collective feasting, like potlucks, and other forms of reconciliation. Um, now let me address the point about the and squandering. Um, I think we have to think squandering in a particular way from a degrowth perspective. We have to move from destructive waste and luxury to a kind of creative squandering. Because we have a lot of squandering within capitalism. Waste as creative destruction is an essential move and driver of capitalistic accumulation and the logic of growth. And, uh, as in, and it's essential to the logic. But we also have, a, we could move towards, again, a different form of squandering, which is a feudal mode of squandering, which is where the surplus is not reinvested, 
but it's stuck in luxury projects which are only accessible for the few, like the py pyramids in ancient Egypt. What is squandering from a degrowth perspective? It is the kind of destruction of the surplus in a collective way which is used to reduce inequality, enhancing social relation and solidarity. And this is about the fun part that Philip mentioned before. Uh, feasts, play, art, dance, craft, and more than that, is a creative construction against creative destruction. And how about thinking of the so-called refugees crisis? Um, how about really using all the surplus for unconditional solidarity with immigrants and across the borders? This would be a very nice idea of degrowth mode of squandering. And I leave it here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Barbara, so much for this uh, very comprehensive uh, talk, uh, giving the structure structural analysis of the problem, but also outlining so many strategies that we can actually discuss uh, during the day in the parallel sessions. So without further ado, I just want to open the floor for the audience. Uh, so can, can I just see the hands for questions and comments? Can, can you just raise up your hands? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm Judith from University of Debrecen in Hungary. Uh, it's rather a comment than a question. Uh, along the days, and also today, I have this word of balance in my mind, because, uh, for example, um, you were talking about uh, entrepreneurship mindset, and I think the reason why it's important, because, for example, uh, I don't have work and life balance, because I think work is your life as well. So it can be a fun, and somehow if you are, uh, have a social entrepreneur mindset, then maybe you are looking what is your strengths, what is the work you are looking for. So the words I, for me, like balance, uh, transparency, and system thinking, I think which can help in this process. Thank you. Okay, I will just collect a few, uh, and then give Barbara a chance to uh, hi, I am Angelos Varvarus uh, from uh, ICTA, Barcelona. Thank you very much, Barbara, for this fantastic presentation. I would like to focus a little bit on, um, on a part of your presentation that I think that uh, was not developed as much as I would expect it. And it is the um, discussion uh, for the competition versus cooperation. Uh, but I think that there is a very big issue there because uh, that has not been tackled enough and it's the power issue. And the power issue, not only the interclass power issue, but the power issue within the groups, the power issue uh, among people that are about to cooperate uh, with each other. In the sense that many times we are talking about cooperation as something that eliminates uh, power, but I have worked with several groups the last few years and I can see that power cannot be eliminated. Possibly domination can be eliminated. So I would like you a little bit to, um, to say something on this topic and a little bit like one more point is about the pants, that it's not only about fists and party but it is mechanism for the prevention of domination. Yeah. Can you see more hands? Uh, one more hand. Just raise your hands so I can see them. Okay. Hello, uh, François Schneider. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I want to, to say a few things. Well, about, about Depens, I think, well, I, I have made a workshop uh, yesterday on it. And I think there is really the possibility of so also of non-destructive dépense, non-wasting. And the, the problem with the, the destructive one is that it's based on material energy and so on, and it, it trashing people even sometimes if we go far with it. And it doesn't change the system. You you just continue the same way, and you 
well, waste, the waste you produce. And don't think about avoiding producing the waste. And it's about a change of system. And it's, I find this also with the, the example of the bicycle, from a fast bicycle to a tricycle. I find we don't change the system. I would more take, instead of elephant bicycles, take things like a uh, ammoniac plant, you know, have a Bosch process, a uh, uh, highway system. You know, these are things we, we need to transform into bicycles, uh, really to, to feel that we have a transformation. And, uh, can I mention about a very important workshop we have uh, this afternoon? Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> Barbara, please, uh, if you can answer this free and then we yes. go for another round. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for these questions. I can address them briefly, but I really understand them as contribution to further discussion, and it's great that we have more time for that. Um, though the social entrepreneurship, I know that the, the values there are different, as, as you have mentioned them in terms of uh, transparency, balance system thinking, and it's a, a change, a shift within the logic of the entrepreneur. When I'm talking about the, the neoliberal subject as entrepreneur of herself, um, I'm talking about the, the main idea of the entrepreneur as someone who takes the risk on her own, uh, that um, in which um, there is the idea of investment and return of investment in the future. This is the main logic. Now, um, I, I, I haven't made up my mind yet about social entrepreneurship because I think there are many different modes. Uh, and it probably depends on the context, whether they might be or not in that logic. Sometimes, if they're, I wonder how they can be uh, less um, dependent on the logic of uh, paying back debts, taking, uh, of, of uh, generating profit. I mean, it really depends on what we're talking about, and there are such and such. I tend to think that, um, I was going to use the word cooperatives, but you know there are cooperatives which just redistribute the continuous accumulated profit in a different way, but they don't change the logic of growth. So it's not cooperative as such is not yet a better step. So again, we have to make distinction and look into that, but when I talk about being an entrepreneur of oneself, I'm not definitely not the model of social entrepreneurship, although in a sense the social entrepreneurship is also, again, from a US perspective, this idea of um, you as an individual in relation to other in these networks can do something and change the system. And some incredible things are being done. And I know, especially in the water uh, discourse, I'm, I'm familiar with that. But at the same time, it also reproduces this idea. Um, so it's a contradiction. But we, this is the, also the contradiction of the world in which we live. So I'm not, I don't, I can't. I don't want to disentangle that contradiction, I want to mention it. And on the same line of the contradiction about cooperation and competition, thank you so much for that intervention. Uh, we have to be very careful about a idealization of cooperation. Cooperation is a different mode of organizing relations. It doesn't mean that it is void of power and even that it is void of domination relations. In fact, there are models of, cooperative, of cooperation uh, in which, for example, gender uh, relations or heteronormative forms of domination are very much in place. Just because there is a, a, a horizontality in the decision-making process, that doesn't mean that forms of more subtle or indirect discrimination are not in place. And in general, I think we should be all very careful about thinking that once we have moved some more steps, we got rid of all the negative which has been connected. Even in the ideal situation that we could move beyond capitalism, we will not move automatically then beyond other forms of domination. That was some, some very important point that feminists made about, about that. It's not that once you have changed the relations of production, automatically the uh, gender relations of domination are solved. So we have to keep working on that. It's an ongoing process, even in the <laughs> ideal situation of overcoming it. And so even, I even think that the relation of domination are still there, again. So we have to constantly be reflecting on what we're doing and constantly take that step back and doing that. But power is also a space of empowering. So power and domination are not the same. 
uh, it could be a place for making this transformation and change for the subjects in, in a different sense of power. And the points, um, thank you. I, I probably focused too much on the feast and party because I was very uh, <laughs> much leaving that away in other places. And it was a kind of provocative movie. I also think that that is a way of, as a mechanism. Uh, it's not just about partying, it's about uh, creating social, um, the social um, fabric and regenerating the social fabric. Again, there are models of that which are incredibly, which reiterate forms of domination. Um, so we have to be careful about that as well. But yeah, it's about it, our mechanism of cancellation and prevention of possible forms of domination, but it's not guaranteed that that will happen. And similarly to Francois, if you consider the material flow, it might be that some form of destructive depends uh, does not correspond to that, but it's not destructive in general. It might be very constructive, again, in the sense of um, uh, supporting and regenerating the social fabrics. And, and there are types of destruction which might be acceptable even from the point of view of material flows. I just don't want to use material flows as the frame, the framework to tell people to, to decide how to live under that perspective. You would have to consider that in different, from different angles, I think. And the bicycle metaphor, every metaphor has limits. I think um, I stick to it. It's a metaphor for the whole of society. It's, di it's a different frame. Of course, that bicycle is made of aluminum, if you want to do to the material flow, even if it's common based. I mean, because this is the contradiction in which we live. I think one fundamental message is that there is no, it could go slow, it could go fast, you can uh, have an e-bike, you have a solar battery, I mean, there, I, I'm, it's, it's about um, leaving the contradiction and not entering the illusion that we can go beyond all this contradiction and live in a paradise, because the paradise is always a paradise for those which are in that community, and there is always someone who is being excluded, there is no paradise without a hell. Uh, in the ideal of the construction. So embodying and living the contradiction, I think, is essential. The risk to be blind towards the domination that we ourselves are being reiterating in our practices. Uh, we go for another round. Uh, can I see your hands? Uh, we're trying to aim for gender parity also, so I uh, just want to make sure. Uh, where's the mic? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about something that I think is important to the decolonization of the social imaginary but it has huge implications for the structures and institutions. And maybe the briefest way to express it is, I've been thinking lately that there's something very important. If we reformulated the Declaration of Independence's search for life, liberty, and happiness now, you might say that people search all the time for cost, comfort, and convenience. And these are not, uh, these are, these are, utilitarian values which nobody actually espouses. I mean, they talk more about freedom and enterprise, and, but, but I just think the search for cost, comfort and convenience is driving our own practices so much more than we acknowledge and affects the design of institutions and infrastructures powerfully and how can we tackle that? Okay, so, so where's the paper to sign the four hours work week? I'm totally with you. I, I feel like we're working too much and yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we're not all that privileged to be a Tim Ferriss and, uh, you know, to write successful books and be freelancers and millionaires to just spend time for, for all these other activities that are really great. So, so where's the solidarity to actually just jump on that bandwagon of unconditional income and support platforms like in Germany, the one, you know, Mein Grundeinkommen, or there's a Dutch platform. I'm just wondering if we're seriously ready, even within that community, to, to support the existing you know, small initiatives. And I mean, we could easily form an unconditional income group and just support each other, but 
are we seriously ready mentally to do that? Or you know, do we just talk about it, but essentially don't work on that issue? Uh, can I see hands uh, once again? Heidi from WILF uh, Women's International League. Um, I, would, it's, uh, I have a question which is linked somehow to the power question at the same time. Uh, and you never use the, the expression of peace, social peace, as well as external peace as such. Where would you l locate this? Uh, because it's not a way of keeping quiet and being nice to the other. Uh, it's also about power relations and also kind of self-confidence to um, not to to give up to fear and to um, but to, to speak out uh, if a crisis, a so-called crisis, is coming up and um, peace is really in danger. This um, I would just like to know how you, huh? Yeah, I know. That, exactly for that. Uh, this is not that uh, we are holding hands and being quiet. This is the opposite. Yeah. Um, um, cost, comfort, and convenience. Yes, I think this is essentially another way of saying what I mentioned about the output legitimation of pseudo democracies or you know, apparent democracies in which. Um, the legitimation f for, for that doesn't come from the fact that we are actively, and, and it's a fatiguing process, determining the conditions under which we live collectively, but we accept, we, we are ready to be corrupted in a literal sense of the term, being bought, in a sense, um, for uh, some kind of promise of welfare as an outcome. And, and this is one kind of answer. So the, that has worked pretty well. But the other answer is for whom it has worked pretty well. Uh, because it has worked pretty well for some social groups, but not for all the social groups. Uh, so um, I have presented that in a very, probably a little bit too superficial term in, in the sense that uh, other social groups never entered that promise. Um, the ideology still works in terms of having them climbing the social ladder eventually or as it is again in the US very strongly, if they don't enter the promise, it's their own fault. Um, but, but because it supports the narrative of the output legitimation. So decolonizing that, I think, honestly, I think that we need less of effort to decolonize that because it's already being questioned because it's no longer working, even for those for whom it has worked. Um, the problem is how that questioning is being canalized. It is being canalized in the form of right-wing uh, totalitarian imaginaries to go back to restore that promise of the pursuit of happiness. Um, and it is uh, rather than start starting radically questioning the whole paradigm and the whole idea. And I think that is the decolonization that is needed uh, in, in that imaginary. So how to, that is being canalized. Um, I'm just talking about it. Well, yeah. This is true for almost all of the things that we're, some of us are more engaged in trying to envision and embody alternative, and I think there are so many different experiments in which that happens. But it's also about being ready to move beyond the comfort zone, because that would mean um, a lot of changes. But again, who is the we? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know how to frame it. I wanted to say, I'm not sure the, the we in this room is necessarily the we uh, for the transformation. Could be important to make clear some lines to discuss it, but I don't, I think that the change of the transformation will come, first of all, from other countries in the world and probably also from other people, and it's already coming. So they're, they're already doing it in other places. That is already happening. Um, so, because there is not comfort zone out of which there is a risk of, you know, just, there is no comfort zone. Um, and it's triggered by other motivations than maybe 
for us, it would be less ideological. Um, I don't, that's not an answer, but I'm saying that in that direction is probably I'm going. And social peace or peace in general, social pacification is a different concept, is about addressing the social conflicts within a community or a society, but also among societies and communities. War is a fabulous driver of growth and is a fabulous means for um, um, having capitalistic accumulation ongoing. It's part of the creative, creative destruction. It's, it's, perfect, um, it's a perfect instrument. Um, if you look into the causes of war, we, we, you probably all know that one of the many different causes and compl complex causes of the war in Syria is, among others, also very heavy environmental um, um, problems related to ongoing um, desertification, basically. Right? So um, we are already talking about that in what we're talking about here. Um, so I'm not sure how to, to address that, except that I'm talking about the crisis we might be entering, going through a threshold that might change the structure in which capitalism works in some societies, in some countries in the world. But again, when you say the crisis will come, I think we are already in there. We have been there. Again, who is the we? For many people, they have been there already for a long time. And uh, maybe the qualitative shift that we are entering uh, threatens this us. Um, this is why we're very aware of it, of it but um, for many people in the world, it's not that the crisis will come. It's been there f for a long time. We, we should conclude, I don't know. Yeah, I think we, we, we have some also logistical announcements also uh, to be made. And uh, uh, first of all, apologies to, to Barbara and uh, to the audience for the technical difficulties we had in the beginning. And uh, once again, thank you, Barbara, for this wonderful...